Fire engineering podcasts are sponsored by MSA. Firefighters want to be connected to each other, to dispatch, and to their commanders. MSA has created Lunar, a wireless, handheld device that includes thermal imaging, firefighter ranging, motion alarm, and cloud technology with GPS. It's part of the new connected firefighter platform from MSA. Learn more at msafire.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fire Engineering Talk Radio in another installment of the Professional Volunteer Fire Department, the podcast dedicated to our great volunteer fire service and getting everybody to embrace the message that being considered a professional firefighter has absolutely nothing to do with earning a paycheck. It has everything to do with delivering competent and compassionate service and taking care of not only our customers, but our own members as well. Developing and maintaining a professional reputation simply is the duty of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. And remember, and as we're going to see again tonight, fires and emergency incidents never treat paid firefighters any differently than they treat volunteer firefighters. Tom Merrill here, glad to have you listening in this evening. Today is Tuesday, December 22nd, 2020. I'd again like to thank Fire Engineering and Chief Bobby Halton and Clarion Events for supporting these podcasts, mine as well as all the other great podcasts that cover so many topics within our great fire service. And I am so honored that you choose to listen into my show, and I remain committed to all of you listening to continue to focus on topics of relevance and importance to our wonderful, iconic volunteer fire service. As I said, it's December 22nd. Christmas is almost here, and I want to take the opportunity to wish all of you a very Merry Christmas and a wonderful holiday season. And whatever it is you choose to celebrate, I just want you to know I wish you all the best during this coming holiday season. Um, I want you all to enjoy a very safe and happy season. We know it's unprecedented, but we'll get through it. Enjoy what time you can spend with your loved ones, your family, your friends, co-workers if you're working, and just enjoy this time of year. Because we do, even though it's been a tough year, we always still have a lot to be thankful for. And as we continue through the end of this festive-filled month, albeit, like I said, a slightly different festive-filled month, I want to focus tonight on some serious and, in in some cases, just extremely horrific and very tragic fires that have occurred in our history during the month of December. Now, I'm in no way trying to be depressing or... (laughs) buzzkill the holiday season. I don't want to just focus on these bad things, but I think it's important that we do this because, number one, we remember those who passed away. We honor their memory by talking about their sacrifice. And number two, we can discuss these fires and lessons learned that can serve today to help prevent tragedies from happening again. So basically, their sacrifice isn't in vain. And to help us discuss these fires and the lessons we've learned from them, I am incredibly honored to have on the show this evening one of America's most well-known fire chiefs, a friend to all. And I'd like to welcome Chief Rick Lasky, who, in addition to being such a respected and successful fire chief, definitely shares with me an absolute love of the fire service history and continues to also preach just how important it is for us to understand our past and where we come from and tonight how we can learn from the tragedies and honor those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. So, Chief, welcome to the show, and I can't thank you enough for being here this evening. Tom, I, you know, first of all, you, you said it's an honor. The honor is mine, buddy. Uh, first of all, I, before we get into anything, uh, tonight, uh, I want to thank you for what you do. Um, you know, the, the professional volunteer fire department, that, that, that whole title, I mean, you've heard my buddy, John Salk and I were both volunteers. Uh, we both started that way. We'll both finish that way. Uh, how much we love the volunteer fire service. We love firefighters in general, but, um, what you do to represent that side of our profession is, is absolutely incredible. Um, and I, and I agree with you on, on so many points. I mean, everything you said, you know, we've been doing a line of duty investigations for a long time, and fire doesn't care. 
uh, fire will kill you whether you get paid or you're paid on call or you're a volunteer and you get paid nothing or you receive a stipend or if you're 60 years old or if you're 20 years old, it doesn't care how big or how small. If you drop your guard one time, you're just as dead. You know, and, and, and I think a lot of people, I, I think, Tom, they, they, they lose their focus sometimes, if you will, as to what it's all about and why we're, you know, we're at in the fire service. Um, you know, it, and I, I want to say something to your listeners, and you, you mentioned something about, you know, the whole buzzkill and all that. If you look at reviewing line of duty deaths or tragedies in the fire service, and I'll just say this, as a buzzkill, like you said, you know, your fear was there then you're missing the point. Um, you know, the, the information that, that Tom, I'm going to talk to your listeners is focusing on tonight is going to save lives. And, you know, our good friend, your, your friend and my friend, Tom Chief, Vinnie Dunn from New York, you know, has a quote I use in a lot of my classes. The only way to survive the dangers of fighting fires is to look and examine how firefighters have been killed and seriously injured. And unless we're willing to look at it, it's going to keep having to happen. So hats off to you for talking about it, whether it's December or, March, it doesn't matter. Good, good, good topic, buddy. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Chief. And you know, you mentioned Vinnie Dunn and his quote. And I was going to start off. There, there's three quotes I want to refer to this evening to to get us started. But I'm going to add a fourth because I remember Vinnie Dunn. I'm not going to say it correctly now because I didn't have a chance to look it up. But he said something along the lines of, "There's no new lessons in the firefighter deaths and fatalities and injuries. It's the the lessons are all usually." been learned years ago but just haven't been adhered to and learned from so he has a really good quote on that and uh and uh, it's true it's true there's there's lessons to be learned in all of these tragedies and not just firefighter tragedies but civilian tragedies as well that that we can apply today currently and i think it's part of the professional equation to do that so um thank you for, exactly. for taking the time to come on oh no exactly it's you know, that, that was my whole point earlier. And, and you and I have been together. We've been friends a long time, good friends a long time. And I'll bring it up in class, you know, when we talk volunteer versus career versus volunteer. And I'm like, look, I've done both the majority of my career. I'm, I'm, I had the privilege and honor to, to volunteer once again. I'm volunteering with the Wichita West Volunteer Fire Department right here in northwest uh, uh, northwest part of the Dallas Fort Metroplex, but kind of, you know, near Oklahoma, I guess, getting close to the, to the panhandle, uh, working for Chief Ryan Fetzer and, Assistant Chief uh, Michael Albert and uh, great, great, great bosses, great guys that just have a passion for the job. I love, Tom, I love being around the younger volunteers. And the, it's, I'll tell you this much, it's been like this big, it's, it's like I drank like 10 cases or a panel full of monster <laughs> drinks. The, 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 the adrenaline rush I've gotten out of it, it's, I have to sit in my hand sometimes like because I'm the, I'm the rookie, I'm the probie, I'm the new guy. And um, I just love it, and I'm, I'm just honored that, that uh, the chief there, Ryan Fetzer, has given me the opportunity to, to work for him and, and work there. Uh, but, but I'll bring it up in class, and, and you've been there. I'll ask people, so show me, show me hands. How many people have been to the memorial in Emmitsburg? And about half the class will raise their hand, right? And I go, so just describe for me. Um, if I remember right, there's one memorial for career firefighters, and there's another one for volunteers. And if you're in a big department, you go on the front of the memorial. If you're in a little department, they chose your name on the back, right? And by now, everybody's picking up on my sarcasm, and they're like, no. I go, and I'll ask, how many memorials are there? And they all raise the number, you know, one. I go, yeah, there's one more. It doesn't matter how big or small. Again, you drop your guard one time. We all end up on the same, the same piece of stone, you know. And, and one thing before we move on, Tom, you know, it, it, and I've said this before, and I know you have plenty of times. I started as a volunteer firefighter, and I'm doing it again. Um, if you start as a volunteer firefighter out there, to the young volunteer firefighters that they're listening to this show, and you get a career job somewhere, you know, it doesn't really bother me if you decide not to volunteer anymore, although I think, God, it'd be great if you shared your experience. But don't diss the very family that gave you your start. Right, Tom? I mean, right. don't don't turn around and knock, you know, and I see that. It, it makes my teeth itch. It bothers me. So, like, really? Really, you wouldn't even be in a damn fire service if if the volunteer side didn't give you a chance. You know, someone let you ride a half an hour fire engine. They gave you your training. They, they they got you past a lot of your nervousness and trained you. You got some experience probably. Don't don't turn on them. You you, you know that you know where I'm going with that. I, I, right. Oh, the absolutely. Fire service. If you if you're gonna call yourself a brother or sister in the fire service, then then you have to be the whole thing. You can't pick or choose when you're gonna be a brother in the fire service. So, but anyway, so, all right. So what do I so talk true. about, buddy? Well, you know, like I said, I, I was 
They're going to start off with uh, I, there's three quotes that, that come to mind tonight, and now there's a fourth. And I and I do have I had Vinnie Dunn's quote in my office here, and I and I just I just pulled it up. It's so apropos for tonight. Um, years ago, uh, Chief Dunn was quoted as saying, "There are no new lessons to be learned from a firefighter's death or injury." The cause of a tragedy is usually an old lesson we have not learned or have forgotten along the way. And along with that are some of my favorite quotes that I dug up for tonight. Uh, some uh, One here goes back to World War II, and that's uh, Winston Churchill in a speech to the House of Commons just after World War II, I think it was. Those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. It's one of my favorite quotes, and it applies perfectly with our topic tonight. Uh, well, the other one. Anything new killing firefighters? I mean, really, you right? Know, you, you, right? There's nothing. I mean, <clears throat> we have COVID out there, but we've had other 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 things, not quite as much as dramatic as COVID, that have taken people from us where it hasn't been from an actual fire scene or an accident scene. But it's it, it's getting more and more difficult to find. And I want to say in, 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 a, in an effort to go see aha, but it's it's more and more difficult to find a new cause of a line of duty that it's all old stuff. And and if Tom, if we were corporate America, they put us in jail for how we kill some firefighters, you know, for oh. repeating things. And you know, what I'm saying we're doing the same mm-hmm. stuff. And it doesn't mean you have to be weak. You have to be a, a afraid. You can't means yet we have to be smarter firefighters. You know, wear your turn our, turn our gear. Bring your bring your gear. Bring I mean, bring your tools. You know, be smart, train, you know, know your job, know, stay on task, all those things. And, and you know, don't become a statistic. But uh, Right, right. And know. along with that, along with that, some people ask me why I like to talk history so much and that it's, I think we have a, it's a duty to uh, to remember the sacrifices that were made. And there's another oh, quote that I like to give, and it's an old proverb. Um, all I have underneath it is an old proverb, as long as they speak your name. You will never die. And my God, I think that's so important to understand because we owe it to those who served before. The sacrifices. Now remember too, sacrifice need not always be a line of duty death. In your volley firehouse, how many people, some currently serving with you, others gone, lost to the dust of time, sacrifice to build the firehouse that you enjoy today and it's so important to remember them to have their photos up to remember their names pass on their lessons of what they did who they were to new members coming in the department and oh yes certainly my gosh if there was a line of duty death their legacy should live on forever but as long as we say their name they never truly die Exactly, exactly. The Toledo Fire Department does that. If, it, it's, if, you, if, if you follow Toledo on Twitter, um, they just did one three days ago. They do them all the time in quotes, just what you said, as long as their names are spoken, they are remembered. And they always go back. They just posted one from December 19th, 1907. You know, mm-hmm. um, you know, so, you know, again, you know, that's my thing. So what, what is it? What is it? Old news. In our business, it should be never, right? It's never old news. We should, you know, and, and I'll say this too, Tom. I think sometimes we get hung up on like that whole kill the buzz phrase you said about some people look at it more as that where I look at not only do we need to learn from them or we're really doing a disservice to their death, but we also need to celebrate their lives, celebrate the fact that that while they were with us, think of the difference they made. We, you know, a lot of us know a firefighter that's been taken from us way too early due to a sickness or kill line of duty and, but then when you, you know, you know, say if you roll back, if you jump in Mr. Whoopi's way back machine, you go back and you look and you go, golly, look at all that they did. You know, I, mean, you know, I know I'm very partial to the firefighters, you know, but golly, man, look at all the people they helped. Look at all the little kids they taught. Look at the difference. You know, they were the difference makers. And, and, and it's really hard. I mean, you know, we're a big service. I guess it's, there are some out there. I, I ran into very few of my career that are throwaways. The majority of them are absolutely incredible people and, and, you know, when they're gone, I think it's just a tragedy to not look back and teach other young firefighters or older firefighters how not to let that history repeat itself, but also to celebrate who they were and think that, you know, they were one of us, right? They were right. one of our family. No, absolutely, absolutely. So we have those who came before. We have the lessons that in another quote, and you're going to love this one because it's from one of your 
favorite people and one of your former officers. I believe he served as a chief or a battalion chief under you, and that's Chief Jerry Wells. I was in his class at FDIC one year, and I was so excited to pen a quote he gave me, know your why. I heard him say that in a great class I took at FDIC, and anyone listening, if you ever get a chance to take a class from Jerry Wells, do it, because you're going to walk away just so fired up and enthusiastic for the job. But I found this quote, know your why, so appropriate. And simply put, it's know why you operate the way you do. Know why a certain tool was invented. Know why your department was formed. Know why our fire service has certain customs and traditions and ways of doing things. And know the whys about everything with your department and the fire service. It might not make you become technically better or even more proficient, but knowing where you come from, whose shoulders you stand on, those who made the sacrifices to bring your department and our fire service where it is today, that's all part of being a professional firefighter. And any professional in any organization should know their why. Well, and, and you know, both of us have a tremendous amount of respect for our armed forces, the military, the men and women that serve in our armed forces. All five branches, every single one of them, have to have their history. They have to have their why memorized. They, and not only just memorized, like, okay, I can give you dates and times, but they have to know why. You know, and, and, and Tom, I'll say this, not to get too far off topic, but we're talking about core values and our why, what we do, you know, I remember talking to a World War II FMF um, corpsman, all right, a sailor. You know, my son was, a, you know, served six years in the United States Navy as an FMF corpsman. And the Marines are the only branch that don't have their own, their own medics, their own combat medics, their own corps, whatever, because they're Department of, you know, of the Navy. They use Navy corpsmen. You know, John Bradley, we are, you know, the, the famous statue that they took for the picture, the photo on, you know, uh, Mount Sarabachi with the post and the flag um, was an actual U.S. Navy FMF corpsman in the Army. They call them combat medics. Um, so, Tom, I'm, I'm, I'm at the airport, and this old dude walks up, and I see the hat, and I go to talk to him. And he tells me, I go, oh, my son's an FMF corpsman. He's in, he's in Afghanistan right now with his Marines taking care of him. And we're talking about it. And I gave him a challenge point, Tom. And we're on the plane flying. I'm flying to Sacramento from Dallas. And halfway through the flight, he taps me on his shoulder. He's standing the aisle. And right then and there, he recited the Sailor's Creed. And when he did it, he had tears in his eyes. Wow. And I never forgot that because that's, you know, that, that's the, the Sailor's Creed. It's what they embrace. It's what they, what they wrap their arms around. And here's this old dude from World War II that's standing on the airplane, and he could still recite it word for word. All those years shows later. You, Talk about the why, you know what I'm saying? The what, you know, why? I mean, it's just, yeah, it's a great point. And Jerry Wells yeah. was a battalion chief of Louisville, just recently retired. He's still out there teaching again, like Tom said, attend one of his classes. But Jerry's a great guy, great chief, oh, great fire. Great, you know. great. Had a chance to stop at his firehouse one night. I was down there, and he, he treated me like a king. And me and the visitors <laughs> I was with, we had a nice dinner at Station 7. And, uh, oh, good man, good good crew that yeah, night. We had a good yeah. time. So, so, Chief, isn't it amazing just how tragic this month of December, is people say, why December? Why are you picking December? And it's like, because if you look at our history, oh my gosh, the amount of fire duty in December just seems to be astronomical compared to other months. And some of the tragedies, especially around the holiday season, are just so horrific. And um, do you think there's a reason for that, or is it a coincidence? Or what you know, is with the I, holiday I month? About that. Yeah, I, I've thought about that too, Tom, about you know, what is it? And again, then I look back at all the other months, and you and I, get, you know, we're into the history. And you look at some of the other months are, are pretty tragic as well. You know, if you look at the numbers and, you know, the losses, uh, you know, life wise for firefighters. And I don't know, maybe it's because it's December, it's everybody, everybody always aligns, you know, Christmas, Hanukkah, you know, the holiday season mm -hmm. with, you know, the month of December. And may, maybe that's the reason, you know, um, I know I know one of the ones we were talking about before we went live that I know you're going to want to talk about <clears throat> actually happened in November. Um, you know, when you and I do our history class, one of the things I talk about is, you know, the whole why thing that Jerry talks about. You know, similar, I talk about, I, I've been stressing for 20-something years about 
what it is, that phrase, it, you know, hey, our mayor gets it. You know, my daughter's softball team, the young girls, they get it because they're, they're good sports and they have, they're great. They do community service. They get it, right? Their parents get it. Well, how many firefighters know what it is and what our it is? And a lot of it has everything from red lights in the front of firehouses and telegraphs and all that to the entire fire service has molded itself via tragedy. And, and that's what a lot of young firefighters don't get time in the academy or when they're doing their in-house training at their firehouse. You know, like, well, they, there was Dalmatians and steam fire engines and, okay, let's move on. And I'm like, no, no, wait a minute. Why don't you tell them why we even exist? Why are we even here? And, and you know, when, when a young firefighters complain about doing pre plans inspections, the legendary thwarting the side for a lot of people, truck checks and the volunteer firehouse, right? I'm like, mm-hmm. what, I, I, you know, if, you, if, if you're complaining about inspections, pre plans, truck checks, or training, I just smile because I know in your heart of hearts, you don't get it. You don't get what it means to be a firefighter. It's not what they have in these movies and television shows. It's not even what you read in some of the books. It's it, everything we do. The reason we exist in the fire service today is because bad things have happened to people and bad things continue to happen to people. That's everything, Tom, from uh, I've asked people, you know, the reason we have codes, the reason we do inspections pre plans is because because so many people have been killed or, or dramatically badly injured, but most of the time because they've been killed. The whole reason, you know, uh, the whole reason they put methyl mercaptan, you know, mercaptan in uh, natural propane gas, you know, nobody said, well, when I asked the question, why do they put it in there? They go, well, to make it smell. No, that's not the reason. It, well, yeah, it makes it smell because in its natural state, you know, propane and, and natural gas is odorless. That's not the reason. You know, March 18, 1937 in New London, Texas, if, if for those out there, if you go to the Google and you Google the, the Texas, Texas school explosion, New London, Texas, New London Middle School, March 18, 1937, gas was considered green gas, had no order to it, right, Tom? And, right, right. You know, a shop teacher, or shop teacher, shop, uh, I'm sorry, a worker started a belt sander up. It was, some people reported earlier, shop teacher, but it was a worker, and blew the school to smithereens, a brand new middle school, killed 325 little kids and their teachers. And two weeks later, Texas legislature passed a law saying he had to put a captain in natural propane gas and the rest of the industry follows suit. So when they set the tones off, when they set the pages off, when they blow the siren for a gas leak and a young firefighter says it's just another BS gas leak, I'm like, no, it's not. The only reason we just went out and we're going to this gas leak is because 325 little kids and their teachers got killed. Right. You know, the KJ right. Memorial, the nursing home in Missouri, all those nursing home patients that burned to death. That, that week, the, the, the governor of Missouri changed the laws regarding nursing home inspections, and the rest of the country followed suit. You know, everything, the, the reason, the reason, the reason, the reason we have the, the, the hotel code, lots of hotel tragedy, right? There's always a tipping point. We're not going to have to happen anymore. Lots of hotel tragedies. The Weinkauf Hotel fire in Atlanta, Georgia, you know, that, that was one of the tipping points for hotel, uh, hospitals, the Cleveland mm-hmm. Clinic fire. And, and, you know, where the x-ray film burnt, fi- uh, uh, burnt up and created cyanide, killed the patients. The reason of codes of prisons, because the Ohio State Penitentiary fired 320 fatalities, 320 people killed in that prison. You know, mm. and you go on and on with you all these, right? You on know, and so, right. so all the social clubs, you know, and it's because of, it's, it, it, you know, that's why you take pre plans seriously. You take, when you go on an EMS call time, I know where I'm getting ahead because we're going to talk about a couple of these that directly relate to this. When you're on an EMS run and you see an exit blocked or chained, you don't go, hey, hey, Tom, when we get back, we probably need a left fire prevention. Yeah, we will. No, you know what you do? You go, uh, you know, when the call's over, can I see the manager? Look, I'm not trying to seem like a hard nose here, but come here, come here. This has to be unlocked and cleared. You know, we can't leave until it's done. And I'm, I'm, we're going to have to follow up with fire prevention. Or you're talking, you, you know what I'm saying? Because now you get it. Now you know that a whole bunch of people died because of a blocked exit. Yeah. Or several mm-hmm. block things, and it has meaning to it, like some of the yeah. stuff we're going to talk about tonight. So yeah, and even go, uh, that's, that's no, really you're so right. You know, and <laughs> again, I think that's a topic for a great show, and I know you've done shows on it, and it's something I should probably delve into someday. But hey, Chief, even even in my backyard, um, the reason in our state why we have such strict codes when it comes to running fire drills in the school. In 1954, I think it was 1954, our neighboring fire district next door to us, a school fire killing 15 students. 
Yeah. And uh, that led to reforms in how fire alarms are installed in schools and how the schools have to run so many fire drills every year. I talk, there are firefighters alive today that were students in that school, volunteer firefighters that I know that were students in the school at the time. And I've talked to fire, um, uh, people who were firefighters at the time that fought that fire. Fifteen students deceased, or a combination of students and, and teachers maybe, but 15 of them deceased in 1954 at a school fire, which led to reforms in school. We could go on and on about that, but it, wait till, knowing wait till your wife... the Angels under, fire. Yes, which wait we will we get, get into. To that one. Yeah. yeah, and, and it, I know we said we were going to start in December, but as I started compiling my notes and looking things over, I had to throw this first one in. Here we are getting into the first fire a half hour into the show, but that's okay. <laughs> Okay, well, but, that was your so, monologue, right? We were doing your monologue. <laughs> right, absolutely, absolutely. That was the monologue, was the lead-in <laughs> to uh, what we're going to talk about. But maybe we should call it the, the holiday season fires because this first one I want to talk about happened on November 28th, so we can consider it the season between Thanksgiving and the New Year. That's the range of fires we're going to talk about. It is the holiday season. Thanksgiving kicks it off. But November 28, 1942, the Coconut Grove Fire, which ranked as the deadliest nightclub fire in history. It ranks, I should say, as the deadliest fire nightclub fire in history. 492 fatalities. And it's the second deadliest building fire in U.S. history. The first deadliest was the Iroquois Theater fire, which I think we'll get to in a little bit. But this fire certainly led to a lot of reforms. And, Chief, I don't know if you want to take a little bit that you know about it or you want me to start off, but uh, let's talk about the Coconut Grove fire. Well, you know, when when you look at this one, you know, there's if you looked at just places of public assembly regarding, you know, social clubs, if you will, you know, and, and even if you took December out of it, there are so many of them for the Brooklyn Theater, the Rhodes Opera House in Boyertown, Pennsylvania, the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Kentucky, Happy Land in the Bronx, but the State Center West Warwick, Rhode Island. I mean, you go on and on and on, you know, and they, they, they all focus, Tom, around older materials for some of them. Forget, we'll get to West Warwick probably a little bit, just to, I don't know, was it in December, but, you know, when you looked at, at all these the flammables that were allowed to be placed inside some of these buildings, the lack of inspections, the lack of codes and, and or code enforcement, um, blocked chain, nailed shut, uh, hidden exits, you know, it means of egress that people could get to. Um, all the, it's like you said before, it's all the same things repeating themselves. Uh, Coconut Grove was, was a decent sized place, but it wasn't this gigantic you know, like you see, you used to see some of these these halls, these these clubs that were so huge on multiple floors, and all that. It was big enough. Don't get me wrong, but you know, I mean, if you look at the uh, the capacity, and you talked about the 492 lives that were taken, uh, that was like, and it, it may not seem like a big deal to some people. That was like 30 or something more people than the building was allowed capacity wise that it was authorized to have. Well there's a reason why we set capacities in place of public assembly. That's how many people, you know, that determines your means of egress, right? All your different exits, how many people can get out quickly in the event of an emergency without jamming up the doors and so on and so forth, that number of exits, you know, and here was another one of those, you know, again, that resulted in people being charged with manslaughter and, and, and being convicted of it. Um, Very, very tragic, you know, the tragic fire, you know, the Air right. Theater fire in Chicago claimed 602 people. And, you know, uh, granted, you know, we're, we're talking December fires here. Um, you know, when, when you, when you look at each and every one of these things we're talking about, there's so many in the fire service and John Salker does the best with his line of duty that linked chain. You know, we look at line of duty that you, if you cut, if you cut one, you know, link out of the chain, Okay, um, it's no longer in most cases line of duty death. If they just call Mady, if they just did, well, it's kind of the same thing with this. You look at this long link chain in most of these fires of all these violations of things that weren't right, and you're like, well, if that exit, if those exits weren't, you know, this particular fire or another one wasn't, weren't nailed shut, if those weren't changed shut, those weren't, you, you know what I'm saying? Um, who knows what would have happened? Um, right. you know, or what, what, we probably, we might not even be talking about it, right? 
Right. They they say that this is the I had a little headline for this one. The fire started by a kiss because the the rumor is and, it, and it's a lot of the reports are all similar that it was a soldier who de- was desiring to basically uh, get intimate with his girlfriend, his date. They wanted a privacy of a dark corner and he unscrewed a light bulb. Right. And and uh, the, one of the staff members then went to screw the light bulb back in, I believe, and it sparked, and that led to well, this fire. Letter, he used a match. They talk about he used the he couldn't see it, he couldn't see the bulb, so he lit a match to see it. Now they say he put oh, the match yeah, out. Yeah. You're right. He did. He lit a match. Like right minutes later, that's where they saw the fire. So either the bulb sparked or did something like you said, or you, you know what I'm saying, or right, you know right. what did he. Who knows if he held the match and something started smoldering and then he blew the match out or put it out. Okay, it's out. Doesn't take away the fact that somehow in the same area where they went to put the ball back in, that that's, you know, what they're saying, that's for their records, you know, that's the origin of the fire. But. 492 people killed. My notes indicate that there were a thousand people or more in this nightclub that was raided for 490 people. So just an absolutely horrific fire um, that definitely some major lessons were, were taken from this fire and, and, and reforms, uh, inward, outward doors, I believe. Well, um, and we're... Tom, think about that real quick. You know, so 400, you know, all these, all these people get killed. Like I said earlier, 30 plus more than are actually is capacity or authorized, yet over a thousand. You know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. golly, mm-hmm. that's more than that's more than double what you're supposed to, you know you're supposed to have in there. And it was just inspected too by the Boston Fire Department. By the way, the Coconut Grove is was a nightclub in Boston. The fire occurred November 28, 1942, packed with revelers. But ten days before, a Boston Fire Department captain inspected the, the uh, nightclub in it passed its inspection it was up to code for the day or he overlooked things but i think it was up to code for the day and uh, as a result of this fire a lot of things we take for granted today became the the rule of the land such as doors swinging outward having enough exits having the exits lit properly and uh it's just a real tragedy no longer that you can't have just one revolving door in the front was from this one um, you know, so many people, you know, got, like you say, got jammed up. If you look at West Warwick, that dramatic video, how fast, within seconds, <clears throat> they're piled in it, and that's it. Everybody's going for the, the, the entrance that came in. If, again, there's other entrances, and they all got jammed up at the doors. Um, you know, they, mm-hmm. there's, I mean, w- there were windows that were boarded up in this building um, that could have been used as an emergency exit. There, there were... <laughs> there were other there were other doors and, and, and that they were blocked, um, you know. Um, you, you know the, the the report is so many people that actually made it through the smoke, trying to find exits, found all but one, which were either non-functioning or hidden in in non-public areas. All but one. And, all but and one. That explains the whole uh, everything leading up to manslaughter. So I was like, oh my god. I mean, I mean, just horrible. Mm, absolutely horrible. Absolutely horrible. And uh, some of the, some of these people reported some of the bodies. People were found at their tables still holding their drinks. That's how fast this fire took off and killed. They were sitting at their tables with their drinks in their hand, dead. That's yeah. how fast this fire took off. I think sometimes we just think that can't happen. Well, it has happened. I hate to say it, it can happen again, but. Out of these tragedy has come the reforms that hopefully has prevented a lot of this from right. happening again. But don't ever say never, and that's why we got to be diligent. And like you said, when we're on never. an EMS, never say never. When you're on that EMS run, look around, and if something needs to be corrected, correct it. And if you have to notify your inspection department to follow up, do so. It's part of our job as professional firefighters, whether you're earning a paycheck or not. You know another. Another thing that came out of that that I read, which was very interesting, was treatment of burn victims. They did some experimental treatment on burn victims that's still done today because it was so successful. Horrible to think about, but something that they uh, a take a good takeaway of that fire was better treatment for burn victims from that fire. They certainly had enough of them to work on. And um, Another thing that I read, which was just horrific to put this into some sort of context, people, 492 were killed, including a wedding party. 
a bride, a groom, the best man, the maid of honor, the groom's sister, wiped out in this fire. Which, oh, by the way, which, oh, by the way, grew because they before the fire department was notified what do you think was happening everyone was trying to put it out themselves by dousing the waiters and waitresses or were dousing it with water and trying to put the fire out themselves and as you said that fire took off so fast they were fighting a losing battle and by the time the fire department got there 492 people had met their demise Oh, the delay in alarm and how many tragedies is is a huge factor. When people don't call right away, when they try to put the fire, whether it's a house fire or something, you know, a much more greater scale, um, you know, that delay in alarm, I mean, that, heck, we teach people in CPR. The first thing you do is tell someone to dial 911 and come back and tell me you, you called, and then you begin working on the patient. And how many people, well, we can put it out, we can put you, we can do this, or whatever, and it doesn't happen. And it just right. grows and grows, right. and then... And that's it. Now they're being chased out of the building. Right. Right. So another lesson but learned a lot there of, is it, oh, don't Thomas, delay. Thomas, sorry to interrupt you. So many great, great, unfortunate and tragic, but so many great lessons were taken from this horrible event. Um, you know, I'll say just the things we're going to talk about tonight, and you know this, as we talked about, there are so many lives, so many people who are alive today that don't even know it. You know what I'm saying? They, they, they wouldn't, they're, gonna, they're skipping through life having no idea how close they were is something bad for them being taken from this earth if something wasn't changed the month before, the year before, 10 years before, or whatever, or 50 years before, because of something that happened like you saw at this particular fire. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. November 28th, 1942. And and I think I told you this, Chief, and just for our listeners, you never know the connection you personally might have with some of these events. And in my little volunteer firehouse, the Snyder Fire Department, we had a, a life member, <clears throat> passed away many years ago, a World War II veteran that happened to be on Liberty. That's leave for the Navy, and he was in the Coast Guard, I believe. <laughs> and he was on Liberty that night, and he was at the Coconut Grove Fire. Never talked about it. We had to drag it out of him once we found out. Somebody knew, and when we finally got him to talk about it one night, he did discuss it. But he happened to be there that night, a firefighter from my own department during World War II on leave at the Coconut Grove and personally witnessed the fire. Amazing. Well, so many soldiers and sailors raced to help people. Um, you know, a lot of them and a lot of firefighters, as they were dragging the bodies out, ended up being treated for badly burned hands um, mm. because of uh, how hot this fire was. Doing what they and do so well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Always willing to help. Yeah, Don Cunningham, that was the name of our member. Good man, been gone a long time, but we remember him tonight as we talk about the fire he was at as a member of the Coast Guard. So now let's move into the month of December, and we got one right from your neck of the woods, right, Chief, which I know Chicago has had their share of horrific fires. But uh, uh, first day of the month of December, 1958, that's a, that's a pretty major anniversary for, for horrible fires, and another school fire it was. Lady, our Lady of Angels, right? Uh, Ninety-two children, I believe, and in, in several yeah, nuns, our three Lady or four of nuns. Mm-hmm. Three nuns, ninety-five fatalities, ninety-two kids, three nuns. Um, uh, you know, and again, we talked. Uh, you, you mentioned a, a tragic school fire in your area. Um, <clears throat> this this particular one, um, you know, there's the, the story behind it. There's lots of there's some pretty incredible, hard to read books on this fire because. When you when you get into the fire and, and there's firefighters that were kids were trying to get to the windows and they were dropping their hair was igniting and they were jumping out the windows on fire and you know um, this building had a raised basement so the second floor was more like a third floor um, the delay in the alarm um, all the code problems uh, you know and we'll, we'll get to that in a second um, a lot of firefighters had kids that pair I mean they lived in that neighborhood that's where their kids went to school. Uh, but December 1st, 1958, Arlene, as a matter of fact, my, my, my younger brother, he passed away. He was nine. I was 13. Uh, he's, he's buried at the Queen of Heaven Cemetery in Hillside, Illinois. And that's, he's in a children's section about 20 feet from where a lot of the victims were, were buried. And there's a big memorial to them in Hillside, Illinois, uh, wow. at the Queen of Heaven Cemetery for this fire. But Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, but this particular and, – and, and, you know, for those of us that are history buffs like Tom and I, um, this, this was the big, gigantic national worldwide change in schools. Um, 
you know, the, the whole grandfather clause. If you look back at, at schools, especially, and, 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 you know, yeah, Chicago had a lot of bad fires. So did New York, so did Boston, but those were the big cities back then. And that what you know, you have a lot of, you put that many people together in those big cities, you're, you're unfortunately bound to have something that's pretty bad or pretty dramatic. So yeah, there was a lot of fires in Chicago, a lot of fires in New York and, and Boston and different places all over the country. But, but Tom, when you look at the schools back then, and the fact, you know, I tell you, like I said, I go back to this whole, the whole gas leak thing. Well, you know, there are a lot of firefighters that they don't want to go do a, a fire drill to school. I can't think I can stand it. I've heard them say, call the kids, the brats, go stand there. And I'm like, do you even know why we're even going? The only reason we're going out and doing a fire inspection at school is because, you know, 92 kids and three nuns were killed December 1st, 1958. You know, and, you know, bring them back, show them the memorial pages and show them the dead kids and forget even all the ones that were badly burned and disfigured and injured. Just show them the ones that are deceased and go, really, that's what you think about doing a fire drill? No. Oh, my God. It's, 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 it's something we should be learning from. Um, you know, this particular building, I mean, where you see, you know, the fire started, it took it down a trash can at the bottom of the stairs. It, it went undetected for a while. You know, there was no sprinklers. Sprinklers were in, in uh, like big warehouses of factories and newer schools, but not there. And, you know, there were a lot of things. The alarm wasn't hooked to any alarm. alarm wasn't was hooked into the department. fire. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. No, and, 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 and there are lots of things didn't work. Different things that, you know, there's, I mean, when you read this fire, this, this could be a whole show of all the things uh, that went wrong at this fire or set this fire up for disaster. You know, the Chicago Fire Department is an extremely progressive fire department with some absolutely incredible firefighters and officers. They always have been. Um, but you know as well as I do, sometimes politics plays into a lot of what we do and actually hinders us from doing a good job because we're fighting to get new codes put in all the time and get this changed. And we have a lot of people, I'll just say at City Hall, who are fighting us because they're trying to take care of the people out there. In some cases, they're building their buildings. In some cases, that are wanting things not to change for the, for the wrong reasons. Um, but everything, when you look at what into this, this particular fire, that's, it, it was set up for disaster from the beginning. And, uh, uh, and sadly, even after this fire, as much as a lot of things changed, Tom, a lot of schools didn't change. A lot of schools didn't change or fix or amend what they had to do within their buildings to prevent a tragedy like this from happening again. Um, but what it did bring was the fire inspections and, the, you know, the pre-planning and the fire drills for the schools. And the very famous poster, uh, you know, taken by, the, you know, the father of a, a friend of mine, um, uh, you know, when you look at um, uh, the picture that was taken uh, of a firefighter, Dick Scheidt, or Dick, hey, Richard Scheidt, but he wrote by Dick Scheidt, carried Michael Joukowsky, the, the deceased child out, you know. An old, I've seen Florida that photo, guy. yes. That's a horrible well, that was photo. Actually a, well, yeah, and that was a poster, Tom, that the NFPA used, a poster, a poster to get people into this. You know, David Lasker is was a photographer of the Chicago area forever, for a long time, and Steve Lasker was dead. Uh, I think he worked for the Tribune one time. He's taken some amazing photos, award-winning photos, uh, as a journalist, and, and that he took that picture, and that was all about bringing reform or bringing change uh, to, to, to the schools. Um, you know, again, money's everything. Um, money's everything. And, you know, some of this is going to change. Some of this isn't going to change. But, you know, when, when you look at, it, you know, this is Quinn's, Commissioner Quinn's idea, concept for the snorkel came from, you know, you look at this fire, everything evolved from here. Um, you know, the, the firefighters responding, they were sent to the wrong building. They were sent to the rectory when they start stretching lines. By the time they realized, then they had to reposition everything, come around. You had, you had you know, metal fencing gates, wrought iron down there because they had some damage, some vandalism. So that impeded, they had to, you know, they had to force their way through metal gates. Um, you throw ladders, like I said, to a, a building that has a raised basement. So we're not talking a normal two story. We're talking, you know, what would be normally almost a three story. Um, that my heart goes not only to all the people who lost family members, but to the, Oh my God, to our, our firefighters, the firefighters that were there. Um, could you imagine, you know, when you got done thinking, what, what, what the hell just happened? You, you know what I'm saying? I mean, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, this, if you listen to stories for some of these, these, these incredible firefighters, I'm like, 
they felt like they failed. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, that's a very easy thing to feel when the odds are stacked against you before you even receive the alarm. You know, right. Chicago is right. a great fire department, always has been. But, oh, my God, when you, when, you, when you see all the things that were wrong and all the things that went into this, um, you know. You know, you it, mentioned – you mentioned, uh, you know, we could do a whole show on that, and um, and you talked about we could do a whole show on how this was just such a setup for disaster, but you know what else we could do a whole show on was the actions of the Chicago Fire Department, their Herculean actions to, to save oh. life and the things they did. I mean, they were there within minutes of getting the alarm. It just took a while to get the alarm to them. I believe when the first teacher pulled an alarm box, which was only an internal alarm, it didn't even ring the first time. She had to pull it a second right. time to get it to ring in the building. And you know, and that didn't go to the fire alarm office at all. That still had to rely on phone calls. And so, but yeah, so we talked about well, some of the nuns, some of the nuns, Tom, that recognize, you know, they, they, and there's pictures of this. If you Google it, you know, you can find them. Uh, they were in the book to sleep with the angels, you know, a couple of classrooms. They, they told them to sit at their desk, get the rosary and pray. Cause they knew they were trapped or to get in a circle. And that's how they found some of these kids, oh, you know, deceased that. at their desks, you know, praying, um, mm. you know, it's, it, it, if you can, it, if you the sleep with the angels, if you can read that book all the way through without crying, you're a pretty cold hearted mm. hearted person. You know what I'm saying? Oh. It is a very dramatic book with, with interviews with actual victims and eyewitnesses, firefighters who were alive then to talk about it. Um, oh, you know, just, but let's look at where we're at today, Tom, with schools. In right. some cases, the school districts have done their job to catch up. In some cases, they still haven't. And I'll, I'm not going to point out any school districts in particular, but there there are some out there that still haven't, you know, you know when, when they when they vote for a bond package or a referendum to, to and they put in their life safety, and you look at what they're spending, I'm like, that's really not life safety. I know technically you could say it is, but that's not. That's that's doing nothing to protect the children that are going to school there. But I will say this on the other hand: there's there's an incredible amount of great school boards and superintendents and principals and teachers that have done incredible things to encourage their schools are safe at the same time. So right. it, that's why, right. You got to get out, you got to do the inspections. You got to watch the fire drills. You've got to make sure that gives, cause even nowadays, you know, walk in and see how many schools are actually sprinklered. You know, all it takes is a couple errors. Remember that link chain, a couple that link chain to be put yeah. back in that chain. And the once in a lifetime, accidental fire or intentional fire or whatever and you could be dealing with with another you know hopefully not as bad but you could be dealing with some fatalities and as a fire dispatcher i'll say to my other dispatchers out there that are listening (laughs) sometimes we get roll our eyes you know we're having a really busy day or um it's early in the school year and all the schools are running their fire drills and we have to log them and it's just a little bit of work it's keystrokes is what it is but we got to make sure we know it's a drill we got to log it as a drill and sometimes like oh my god how many drills are they going to do well there's a lot of dead kids that didn't have that luxury of having a working alarm system that maybe give them a fighting chance well, and, and I, you know, and again, we're not talking December in particular, but the station, you know, the, the in West Warwick, and that horrible tragedy, I think, took 100 people. One of the things we did for our dispatch, you know, I'm very partial. I did it. I'm very, very partial. I love my dispatch, my alarm operators. I absolutely adore them. Um, I, I do programs for them all over the country, for the Nina groups and all them. But one of the one of the greatest things we did, I know in Louisville and some other places, is show new dispatchers, or even current ones, um, that video of that fire in the beginning where how fast those people ended up trapped and screaming and dying and burning to death. Mm. And it immediately in a lot of places changes how quick they get to call out. You know, when we're talking about, I don't care if you know what you've got, if you've got, if you've got enough information, you know, bump the call out, keep getting information, get us rolling, get, get the guys getting out of bed, get the guys heading to the firehouse or whatever, you know, wherever, they, whatever the setup is. I, I think we cut a lot of seconds out of our dispatch time just by showing them, that, that video and they were pushing buttons a lot quicker, you know, mm-hmm. because they, you know, they were able to witness something that was a horrible tragedy, but the best thing that video did for us is bring back, you know, the big old spotlight on the importance of means of egress codes. And, you know, if anything, like I said, it taught a lot of our dispatches. Oh my God, I got to get the call bumped out quicker, you know? 
Right, right. Yeah, definitely. Because sometimes you, just, yeah, that's that's the importance of a dispatcher knowing our why, why we do things, and why certain codes and ways of uh, of handling situations are in place because of tragedies like this. And you know, uh, the president at the time, the president of the National Fire Protection Association, he had another quote, which very similar to what I said earlier. He came right out and said, "There are no new lessons to be learned from this fire. It's only old lessons that tragically went on." He did. What a powerful, powerful quote. And uh, school safety regulations were enacted nationwide after this. I think you said it earlier when we first started talking about this was the biggie. This is the one that really set sweeping changes in school fire safety regulations, uh, really got those enacted. And uh, um, within a year, uh, thousands of school buildings in the United States were brought up to a, a better code within one year of the disaster. Yeah, there's always there's a book that's written in the private sector called The Tipping Point, and they talk about how, like, UPS stayed in business as they went from, you know, mail-order catalogs to all the, over the, all the years, and there's always a tipping point with something. And, and, that, and that's one of the, you know, like we said, there's been, you look at all the school disasters that are out there, the school tragedies that have occurred, whether it was due to fire, due to the gas explosion, whatever, and you come to, to, to where we're at now, you know, somewhere along the lines, there was always a tipping point where somebody said, okay, enough is enough. We've got to change this, you yeah. know, and this was yeah. that enough is enough. We have to change how we do things in schools where our children are at. So. And I got two little interesting trivia tidbits with this fire, um, making light of a situation that was so horrific, but it, I just find it so interesting. So the president of the National Fire Protection Association at the time, his name was Percy Bugby. One of my best friends, a fellow fire commissioner who serves with me in the Snyder Fire Department, who has been a member just as long as me, they're going on 38 years now, his name is Burton Bugby. Burton's grandfather, who was also a member of our department, was named Percy Bugby. Now, it's not the same guy, but how many Percy Bugbys can there be oh, in the world? <laughs> exactly. And exactly. one of them was in my department, and here's the president of the NFPA back in the 1950s by the same name. I found that just so interesting. Oh. And, I, and uh, another little trivia tidbit for you listeners and for you, Rick, and maybe you knew this, maybe you didn't. One of the survivors from this fire went on the fame as a guitar player for the rock band journey his name was uh, Jonathan Friga and he went on the fame as Jonathan Kane he was a keyboard and guitar player for journey and he actually helped write a song the lonely and he referred to the fire in that song with a couple lyrics as you search the embers think of what you had and remember hang on don't you let go now little tidbit from that fire. Well, and Mike Mason, former Donner's Grove firefighter in Illinois on the south side of Chicago, southwest side, he was in kindergarten. He was in school that day at, at the Island wow. of fire. And uh, wow. he taught for us at FDIC for, for years. Uh, Mike Mason, mm. you know, uh, was mm-hmm. in kindergarten then. So. Jeez, jeez. Well, let's shift gears a minute now. Um, still talk about fire tragedies, but a little different type of fire situation. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Obviously, we remember that as the incident that launched us, the United States, into World War II. But it was also quite a firefight for civilian firefighters from the Honolulu Fire Department as well as military firefighters. And not many realized, just like on 9-11, firefighters sprung into action when Pearl Harbor was attacked. And 16 were killed, three from Honolulu and 13 from the military. They were called the Navy Fire Department back then. And uh, I just think it's important to kind of talk about that a little bit. And the big lesson learned there simply is (laughs) firefighters, military or civilian, are going to go into harm's way. And we see that time and time again and certainly repeated itself on 9-11. Well, and when you look back at Pearl Harbor, um, you know, and, and we've done a lot of programs, uh, John Salk and I, for the federal firefighters. And, you know, like he, we said earlier, firefighters are firefighters. And uh, uh, my good buddy Shane, he's a company officer at Pearl Harbor right now, today. Um, and we've been out there to visit with him. He's a, always at FDIC. He's a, 
great, great guy, great guy, great firefighter, great officer. He's into the job and all that. But, um, you know, the three Honolulu firefighters that were, that were killed that day, um, you know, like you say, we, we tend to focus on so much. We, you know, we didn't realize a lot of people didn't realize we lost some firefighters, you know, the Navy, the United States Navy for the sailors out there, you know, there's a phrase, every Marine's a rifleman, just like every sailor's a firefighter, you know, and every sailor mm-hmm. has been the Navy changed how they did things, you know, after they lost a whole, but they lost, I mean, you know, the whole, you know, John McCain was, was blamed for something he didn't do when, you know, uh, he just happened to be on the aircraft carrier when they had the explosion with, you know, the guy dropped his bomb off his plane and so on and so forth and all that. And, um, uh, all the explosions and the fires killed the, the onboard firefighters and, you know, those. So that was the launching pad, uh, for the Navy from that point forward, every single sailor that goes to their boot camp is trained to be a firefighter, you know, among all the other things they're trained, there's, they, you know, there, my, my son went through it. Every one of them, uh, it, it, again, for you history buffs, look up, look up, the, look up, you know, when that happened, uh, to the United States Navy and, you know, John McCain and, uh, you know, right away people were like, it was his plane, his jet. It wasn't, you know, there, I think it was the one across from the guy actually released, dropped his, his bomb and it was off to the races and several explosions. Then and you can read the whole report. Um, a lot of sailors lost their lives and, Again, you you look at that and you look at, uh, you know, some of these different things, how everything changes. Pearl Harbor, like you said, um, we lost we lost three firefighters and uh, almost 2,500 uh, uh, American, you know, service personnel were killed. Um, mm-hmm. Another almost 1,300 were, were wounded badly. Uh, but the three firefighters, um, you know, two captains and a, a hoseman, um, uh, Captain John, uh, Carrera, I think, uh, Captain Tom Macy and Hoseman Harry uh, T.L. Pang mm-hmm. were all killed uh, during that. An interesting note about that, I'm sure you're going to bring it up. I'm probably stealing your thunder here, Tom. But um, uh, in 1944, they were all awarded the Order of the Purple Heart, and they are the only civilian firefighters that have received that award. Yeah, uh, yeah. Quite rightfully so, as far as I'm concerned, yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and found it well, interesting that when when the when the gong rang, they jumped on their sea grave chain driven apparatus to head to the to the to the fire. Can you what a sight that must have been there? It was, I believe, Engine Six were the first guys from the Honolulu department that headed in, and uh, they they had a sea grave chain driven engine. I just oh, what a sight that well, had to you, be. Well, if you you were at Station 7, Firehouse 7 in Louisville with, with the town chief Jerry Wells. Right. Uh, I remember seeing on the wall there, there's a gong, a fire alarm gong from Pearl Harbor that was given to us, given to me, and we uh, had it, uh, we reconditioned it and had it mounted. It's hanging on the wall in the firehouse there, mm-hmm. Firehouse 7 in Louisville, Texas. What a great firehouse that was. Ooh, beautiful, beautiful. So the uh, another interesting thing from that too is just the you know so you can look at just consider this bombs are dropping, machine gun fire is hitting the ground. I mean these there's uh, the accounts of these firefighters are incredible. They're pulling up bombs are dropping around them. Machine gun fire is hitting the ground around them. Members are being struck by bomb fragments and bullets. Yet they got to go to work. And the first thing that happens is they have no water. The water mains are all severed from the explosions. They're drafting out of bomb crater holes that are filling with water from the broken water mains to put water yeah. on the fire. I mean, it's, talk about nerve and, you know, just uh, the steel nerve of these guys as, as the war starts. Unbelievable. An absolutely amazing event. Yeah, absolutely amazing to once again to see, uh, you know, our country come together, you know, to, to fight something evil. Right. And then to be treating the wounded and uh, just work to do what had to be done. And here's a, a, a neat little trivia story from, from this whole episode was uh, uh, there was a chief Benedict and he was the chief of the, uh, of the, I believe he was the chief of the military fire department. He, he's, of course, sleeping. It's 8 in the morning. He's awoken, awoken by the explosions. He runs outside just wearing underwear and socks, and he's kind of rubbing his eyes like, what the heck is going on here? But after he sizes up what's going on, he jumps into action, and he's directing his troops, and 
all this goes on for a half hour or so. He's hit by bomb fragments. He's shot in the right leg. He's blown 60 feet into a hangar. Um, He gets up, continues to deliver orders. More bombs are dropping. More bullets are flying. And he gets knocked down again from an explosion. A private runs over to him and picks him up, and it looks like he's dead. And it quickly goes through the ranks that the chief is dead. And they call a chaplain over. And the chaplain comes over and starts delivering last rites. And all of a sudden, Chief Benedict regained consciousness and tells his men, boy, I don't feel really good. And they loaded him in a vehicle and off to the hospital they went. But he fully recovered. He was in critical condition. He had been shot five times. And he was bleeding from 23 different areas from shrapnel. He had two ruptured eardrums, lacerations above his eye, a burnt arm, injuries from being thrown, blown through the air. And the next morning he wakes up and they're working on him and he still says the most classic line that uh, he's the lo- lo- luckiest and most lively corpse ever around. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the doctors had a field day with that. that. But what a legend, what a legend. But December 7th, 1941, you don't think of it, folks, but our firefighters sprang into action and served honorably and uh, did some very incredible things. And unfortunately, many were killed, three from Honolulu and um, 13 from the military paid the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, finally honored, though, uh, getting the Purple Hearts, and uh, just a, a story that I don't think we should forget, and, and a great reminder that firefighters will always be there when needed and do what needs to be done. And when you read what they did that day and the obstacles they had to overcome, you know who's we have all fought fires. Who's had bombs dropping on them and machine gun bullets hitting all the ground around them, or people standing next to them while they're doing it? One other right. instance I can right. think about that we'll talk about in a little bit, but. Uh, December 7th, 41, another story from the month of December in our firefighting history. I want to I shift gears a little bit um, and talk about, what's today's date, Chief? December what? 22nd, right? December 22nd. Somber night in the fire service archives, because we don't have one but two, not one or two, but three very tragic fires that occurred on December 22nd over the years. And the first one I want to talk about, again, very close to your hometown, Chief, right? Chicago, Union Stockyard Fire, 21 Chicago firefighters killed that night. And I believe the fire chief was killed that night, or was it a chief? Or was it the chief of department, do you know? Well, they, they 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 refer to it as the you know, fire marshal chief of department, and uh, here's a guy who came in and um, changed. You know, he started he started ad engine companies and ladder companies, and really was you know it was one of these big shifts with the city of Chicago the fire department. They really started to feel some boom going on. You know, some some things happening. I mean, if you think about it. You know, December twenty third, nineteen ten, October eighth, eighteen seventy one was a Great Chicago Fire. Right. October eighth, eighteen seventy one. Do the math. You know, nineteen. You know, eighteen seventy one to nineteen ten isn't that, you know, <laughs> that long ago if you think about it. So there was a lot of growth, a lot of things going on in the Chicago Fire that he was that he was, you know, actually, you know. Uh, uh, credited with when it came to this, but you know this is another one of those where it, you know it, it went to uh, uh, 411. You know in Chicago that's four alarms and with some specials. Um, they they have an absolutely incredible memorial uh, because of this. Uh, uh, like you said, let us never never forget. Um, but Chief James uh, Horton, you know uh, Fire Chief James Horton, and you know three civilians were killed uh, as well, but. Uh, with his firefighters when, when the building came down, you know, and uh, the, the stockyards, that was a big thing back then in Chicago, obviously. I mean, the, the stockyards with, you know, uh, you know all, all, all the livestock coming through there for everything that was going on, you know, that go on in stockyards, you know, with, with whether it was, you know, beef or, cow, you know, hogs or whatever and all that different stuff. And this was, 
Chicago grew up around the rivers, the lake, you know, the trains coming in and out of there and so on and so forth. And then, you know, what went on with this and a uh, uh, horrible, horrible, uh, another tragedy uh, in Chicago, but, oh my goodness, uh, you know, the, the memorial and, and the recognition that was due to these, these brave firefighters that came afterwards uh, was very appropriate and absolutely, absolutely very nice. Very, actually incredible what they did. Um, but, um, you know, they had, I mean, there was all kinds of problems here. We've got so many fires we want to get to tonight, but I mean, um, you know, there, there were, there were fire hydrants that were shut off because, you know, as cold as it was, they didn't want, you know, the mains freezing and keep in mind what kind of mains we were dealing with back then, you know, and, uh, and what they were made of if you're into your history stuff. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of things that, that, uh, uh, you know, that contributed again to this, the lessons, these things that happened to this fire that probably should have never happen, right? Right, right. And the one thing is that if anyone noticed uh, on my uh, my Facebook posting and my t- Instagram post and you know, the picture I used for advertising tonight's show, that that's from the Union Stockyard fire that killed these 21 firefighters and, and some civilians as well. And, um, I believe uh, it went up to a four-alarm fire, and they got on location, and uh, they were making good progress. And like all collapses, right? It just no warning, or very little warning. And before they knew it, a wall came down, and several were standing under a canopy. You can see the canopy in the picture that I posted, and, and it led to these poor firefighters being killed. So one of the critical lessons there is even today be aware of the collapse zone, maybe pay attention to how long the incident's been on on for. I like when dispatch centers tell the incident commander, hey, you're 10 minutes in or you're 20 minutes in. They give you time marks so you can kind of keep an eye on, you know, time goes fast when you're at fire. and You may not realize it, but 20 minutes goes pretty darn quick. Well, and, and, you know, the time, and a lot of guys forget, you know, when they get reminded, like you said, Tom, of the time on scene, you know, if you are fighting an actual fire, that means the fire has been attacking everything that's put in that building to hold it up, and eventually gravity is going to win. You know, and mm-hmm. so you've got you've got the fire attacking the components of the building. You know, and then you have the elements, and then and then we're pounding it with gallons per minute. You know, we're pounding right. it with water. Um, you know, so so all we have all these these things working against what was put into that particular building to hold it up in the first place. And like I said, I, I always said that eventually gravity is going to win. It's going to come down. Um, so like you said, you know, knowledge of your collapse zones, knowledge of, you know, well, building construction, general knowledge of collapse zones, what you're dealing with, where you're at, apparatus position, firefighter positions, you know, still today you see, you see the videos on YouTube. And I'm like, why is somebody not telling him to move that hose line? Why is he sitting there? There's no way he's going to outrun that wall when it comes down. Right. There's no way, right. you know, and uh, we lose a lot of firefighters when it comes to trust roofs. A trust is a trust is a trust. I understand that. I do a class like that. But when it comes to the bowstring, you know, we lose a lot of them in the alleys because when it's coming down, if even if you had a chance to run, you can only go left or right. In the front, you can scatter. But when you're in an alley, you don't, you don't have, you know, it's very, you're limited. And if you're in the middle, you're probably screwed. You know what I'm saying? Mm. But, uh, like you say, huge lesson here when it comes to collab zones, um, uh, you know, and being aware of your surroundings. And again, time on scene. That was a great, a great point you made, Tom. Yeah, and how much does a gallon of water weigh? If I remember from my early pump operator class or my old school days, it was 8.3 pounds, I believe. And <laughs> how many hundreds, if not thousands, of gallons of water are we adding to buildings? And how how quickly that weight <laughs> adds up, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, if you're it, in it, Chicago and you have a chance, the memorial is pretty, uh, pretty incredible, pretty, pretty incredible thing to see um, if you have a chance when you're in Chicago. As on my list. For these fire on my list. For these on my list, for sure, for sure. And you mentioned something else there about a truss is a truss is a truss, and that brings us into, gosh, 10 years ago tonight. Uh, two Chicago firefighters, again, Chicago, sorry, Chief, uh, Chicago's had their share. Uh, two Chicago firefighters killed, I believe it was a vacant structure fire, um, uh, Chicago firefighter Corey Ankum and Ed Stringer. Um, south side of Chicago, a vacant one-story building, I believe it was a dry cleaner building, 
and uh, started out as a smoke in the area call and boom they found a fire and they're attacking it making good progress and i believe it was only 16 minutes or so after they arrived the bowstring truss roof collapsed and and buried a bunch of firefighters and unfortunately Corey uh, ankum and ed stringer um, paid the ultimate sacrifice well, the firefighter string was off engine 63, and Corey was off tower layer 34. Um, but you're right, yeah, they were searching for homeless, you know, occupants when the truss roof collapsed. And uh, uh, they, they were actually among four firefighters that were buried uh, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it collapsed. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the cause was determined, you know, the whole open – we're talking about, you know, what time of year it is in Chicago, it's cold. Um, you're going to have – you know, homeless occupants, you know, some beggars, different people taking shelter. Uh, but they, they determined the cause from uh, an open uh, flame wood or trash fire that, you know, may have been started by a homeless person trying to stay warm. Uh, but like you said, the, va- the building was vacant for five years. And mm. they, they talked about it all over the news. There's a lot of news stories about how it had a lot of code violations, um, including one in 2007 citation for the defective truss roof that later collapsed for the actual truss roof. So. Mm. Yeah, and and uh, the lesson I have on that, I mean, trust. How many trust, trust, trust? The lessons of the trust roof, <laughs> and I guess that gets to pre-planning, knowing your buildings, paying attention as you drive through the district, um, and 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 paying attention to what's being built, what's being renovated, what's vacant, and 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 just knowing your district as as best you can. I guess that's a good reinforcement from that tragedy. Yeah, and it's it's just. You know, the buildings are going to win. We've, we've said it for years. You know, the buildings, the enemy, the, the fires, the ammunition. And for those that aren't into building construction fire behavior, I'm not saying necessarily you have to be a scientist or an engineer, but you need to know building construction fire behavior. And one of my mentors, Tom, uh, Chief Jack McCasson, when I was an 18-year-old volunteer firefighter going through my Firefighter 1 class, I'd already been an explorer and all that stuff. Chief Jack McCaster told me, Ricky, you want to be a good firefighter, you need to know building construction, you need to know fire behavior. You need to know how the fire's going to react to the building, the building's going to react to the fire. The building's the enemy. Know your freaking enemy. I'll never forget that as long as I live, you know, because that's it. You know, that's we talk a lot of this stuff that's going on. These buildings are actually killing people, you know. Granted, the contents you put in so on and so forth, but, um, you know, I, and I will say this, Chicago is very aggressive when it comes to lessons learned. Um, <clears throat> the city of Chicago, I can't remember any fires where they've lost a firefighter, where they haven't spun around and tried to learn from that tragedy to prevent it from happening again. Sadly, trust roofs are trust roofs. They're still all over the place. Um, you need to know where they're at, where they're hidden. You know, people put rain roofs over them. You want to get, you know, Walmart supermarket in New York City with the FDNY. Um, you know, there's there's rain roofs they put over these, these buildings that are leaking all the time that now they're hidden. That creates a concealed space. <clears throat> um, you know, you need to you need to be out looking. You, nowadays, with drones, Tom, throw a drone up, put your tower ladder up, set it, take pictures from up there. You'd be amazed what you'd see from on top of a building when it comes to what you have up on these buildings, in the way of appliances, you know, HVAC systems, uh, holes, repairs. You can see you can actually see repairs that were made. I was a roofer for a long time. You know, it's amazing what you'll see when you just put your stick or your bucket up in the air or you throw a drone up if you have them. A lot of people want to play drones. There you go. Start yeah. doing some pre-planning. A lot of people are out the drones and look at these buildings ahead of time, um, you know, when you see this. Uh, and record it. Again. Record it and pass and, it on yeah. and work with the dispatch center so they can log it as well. Um, our dispatch center, we've got is, is anytime we identify a truss roof, it goes into the CAD system. Um, so we can warn, you know, units and uh, stay on your guard. Work with your building department. Work with your inspectors and uh, have that two-way communication. They see something, they're telling you to tell the dispatch center or they're telling the dispatch center who passes it on to you and vice versa. You're out doing your pre-plans. You're out shopping with the family. You're out on an EMS run. Take note of these things and make sure they get recorded and passed on because it may not, it may not occur in your career, but 20 years from now it might occur. But but because someone did the homework and logged it today, lives could be saved. Well, and, you know, and I think Tom, a lot of it is for some people, it's not as exciting as cutting a car apart on drill night with the hearse tool. It's not as exciting as doing a live burn or doing tactics. But you know what? You can make it exciting. When you sit down, 
if it's bad weather, snow, and you sit down, let's talk about some buildings here. Let's talk about where would you never want to fight a fire in our in our town? Well, give me a building or two, and you know, I've told people that's a great drill. Have to take a piece of paper out right now. What is the one building you would want to fight a fire in, in town or in our mutual aid automatic aid companies? And you'd be amazed. I'm right at the buildings. Guys go, well, have you ever been to the chop house? No, oh my God, you ever been to the basement mm-hmm. there? You ought to see if you, you know. And now it's like, guys, we've been going on three hours. Oh, we need more time to talk about that. Well, let's set up a walk, right. set up a walk through it, you know, to know the enemy, to know what you've got in there, you know, in that town. And there's some places I, I'll say this: nothing is foolproof. The proofs don't work. Waterproof, burglarproof, you know, fireproof. None of those proofs work. Nothing's foolproof. You can have one of the best inspection and pre-plan programs in the country. And something's, you, I'm not going to say it in a bad way, you're still going to miss something. And maybe it, it probably isn't going to be your own fault. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Things change. You know, some of these buildings that you can't get back to, even though you say you should, you know, you got to be aggressive. Like you said, keep your eyes open when you're walking around and EMS calls and visualize and take a look and, and make some, you know, mental notes that you can talk about later or whatever. But things change, you know, so yeah. do these talks and have fun with them. Right, right. And remember their names. Corey Ankum and Ed Stringer, 10 years ago this evening, paid the ultimate sacrifice. And another December 22nd fire that we could spend in another three hours on, Keokuk, Iowa. Right. Tragic, tragic fire um, resulting in six, I believe, uh, six firefighters were on duty. Um, they lost, uh, was it three firefighters and three civilians paid a uh, Three children, actually, I believe it was, at this fire. And, you know, kudos to this fire department and their chief, a stand-up guy who, you know, faced faced the music uh, after this fire. It was very open and honest with what they did and why they did it. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from this. I believe started out as a kitchen fire. It's a very short-staffed department. They did the best they could do. They operated a certain way for years without getting bit. And on this particular day, three days before Christmas, 1999, Keokuk, Iowa, they had three firefighters and three children perish in a duplex fire. Well, and, and you know, what started out to be, uh, uh, you know, a single-family dwelling converted into a multi-family dwelling frame, uh, balloon frame home. You know, smaller community, Keokuk, very progressive fire department. You know, uh, you know that day they had a horrible, horrible day. And when you, when you think about it, you know, again, you know, it's already cold there. You know, it's already, you know, it's we're talking December. You're like you said, time you're short staffed. You get there when the call comes in, they're telling you you got kids in, right? So the adrenaline's mm-hmm. already is like ramping up on you, right? You're already the adrenaline's already gone. You get there and they're howling at you. you know, my, my kids are inside. My kids are inside. Um, you know, now, you know, we have to take every incident. And like you said, the chief that went and did some lectures on this, you know, was, was very good. Like you said, about facing the music and stand up and saying, this is where we, this is what we did. And this is what we did wrong. You know, and, and again, hats off to him for doing that. There's a lot of people who never go out and say, this is what we did. And this is what we did wrong. And, you know, we, we've, we've said forever, you know, when you pull up at a fire, you know, if you have smoke showing or if you have a fire, if you can only do one thing, if you can only do one task, because right, every fire, whether it's a pot of meat in a stove or, you know, room and contents or it's in the cockloft, whatever, every single fire, actual fire we pull up on, there's three tasks that have to be accomplished. That's fire, tag, ventilation, and search. And, and Tom, we ask people in class all the time, if you pull up and you can only do one, if you only do one thing, like you pull up with your engine and there's only enough people on your engine, this first two engine, to do only one of those three tasks, what would it be? And about a third of the room will raise their hands and, and you know, a big portion will say attack and about a third will say search. And I go, okay, you know, I, I want to ask you a question, just food for thought here. So you could only do one thing. And I said, I said, and your choice is not to stretch a line, your choice is to search. Well, we got people, I said, I understand that. What's the difference between you and the people you're going after? You know, they're in pajamas or regular clothing and you wear a turnout gear, you know, but you're not bringing your weapon with you. Well, you know, I know time, but, you know, this is more training and coming back and stretching hose and getting in there quick, you know, but, you know, if there's only one thing you do, it's stretch a line. And this is why I say, look, I'm not saying, the reason I'm saying you're not wrong is because your entire fire service career 
since day one when you got in your volunteer department or you went to the academy, they pounded your head, life safety, life safety, life safety. Well, life safety is stretching a hose line. Life safety is getting water to the fire, drawing a line of sand between the fire protection victims. When you don't take a line in, and I'll tell you, Tom, we were, we were in Baton Rouge. My buddy Paul is a captain of Baton Rouge on, on a heavy rescue. He's a volunteer fire chief down there in Livonia. We, we love Paul. We've been down there tons of times to teach him. And we're doing a company officer academy. We're doing the first two engine part of the class, Tom. And we get into this discussion. And I've got a group of people, no, you, you search. You go and search. I'm like, yeah, but no, you, the first thing you should do is stretch a line. No, you search. I'm like, okay. So there's two cops, Tom. They're both – the ones from the city, ones from the county, sheriff, deputy, police officer. And they keep sneaking all day long. They've been sneaking in because they're both volleys, right? On their days off from, from the, uh, you know, from law enforcement, police department, they're volunteers. So they kept sneaking in. So right in the middle of this, I walked back to Tom and I go, I got a question to ask you guys. They said, okay, so right now your dispatch calls you, you know, 27, go ahead. All right. Uh, we got a silent uh, hold up alarm, 7-Eleven first at night. Okay, show me a route. 21, 21's a route, right? You're doing that stuff. While that's going on here, 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, I'm in the back room, the back storage room of the 7-Eleven at First Domain, and we're getting robbed. There's a bad guy. He's got a mask on, a hood over his head. He's got a gun. He, he, she's giving, he's got the gun right in my partner's head. Okay, stay in the line with us. we got the police around already in the way. 911, what's your emergency? Yeah, I'm at the gas pumps here. Oh, my car. The 7-Eleven is being robbed, man. There's a guy that got a gun to this lake. You've got two confirmed calls telling you have a hold up in progress, a bad guy with a gun. You're the first arriving patrol car there. You pull up. You take your pistol out of its holster and you leave it on the front seat and you go inside. <laughs> and they both start laughing, Tom. And I go, what? They go, no. I go, what do you mean no? No, I'm not leave my pistol. I go, but that's what they're, they want to do. They're going to drive all the way from the firehouse to this scene. Let's even say I'm going to tell you there's people trapped and they're not going to pull their, take their weapon in with them. I, I said, you see what I'm saying? You know, you can't beat fire out with your fists. And the only thing, you know, you better hope that you can make a grab and get out before it flashes on you. Or, very tragically, the lesson, the, the, the biggest lesson out of this, it wasn't as much the staffing, which was, you know, they were always forcing stuff, stuff staffing. That wasn't the temperature and that stuff. The fact that the chief left the scene with the baby to the hospital came right back and all that, you know, when he came back, it already flashed. The incident commander left the scene. You know, the, the biggest, here's the link chain, right, Tom? The link chain is stretch a line. Stretch the water on the fire. Bring some water. Yeah, bring some water with you. Bring so. I mean, you know. Right. So there, there is the lesson with the horrible event. You know, three children, three you know, uh, assistant chief and two firefighters. And like I said, Keokuk, it's great fire department. I, if my son said he wanted to be a firefighter with Keokuk, I would hesitate in a heartbeat to go to work there. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, right. Tragedy hit him hard, and I'll say this, Tom. I said it before, and I you know you've said it a thousand times. There are firefighters alive today because of the lessons that were shared um, from Keokuk, Iowa, you know, hats off to the fire department right there. They're, they're heroes for what they've shared after what happened. Then. Yeah. The chief uh, Mark Wessel just showed true leadership. And for our listeners, you know, we could, we could spend all night on this fire, but you know, in a nutshell, short staff, early morning, 8:30 AM fire told right from the get go, there's children inside and, and firefighters go in to try and make a grab. Unfortunately, water didn't get put on the fire, allowing the fire to spread rapidly, I believe, from the kitchen and living room up the stairs and led to, to six uh, six fatalities. And um, it, it's, it's worth it to, to read up on this fire and, and investigate. And ask yourself this. We did this as a drill in my department one day. We reviewed this fire, and you throw out those scenarios. You're on duty at your volunteer firehouse. The tones drop. Think of your daytime staffing at 8.30 in the morning. And then just answer the question, what would you do? You know, you people are screaming, kids are in there. You see fire. You know you got trapped victims. You know you got a fire. What would you do in these circumstances? And uh, they manned up and admitted what they did and reviewed everything and the lessons learned. And uh, like Chief Lasky said, great department, great people, a great chief. They just they had a, just a horrific, horrific day. Learn from it and make your department well, and Tom, yourself a better firefighter. And real quick, while we're talking about, you know, Boston's an incredible fire department. And they had that, they, you know, we, we talked about horrific event. Chicago, we talked about that. We talked about the federal firefighters that protect all our military institutions. You know, here, here we're talking about Keokuk 
and we're going to talk about a couple more departments. I mean, they're they're all like like you say, they're all great departments, and, and not because they went through a tragedy. They're great departments to begin with. They suffered a tremendous loss, and in, mm-hmm. in the majority, if not all, the cases, they were willing to share the lessons learned from the event. Right, and, and I think they would share what you said, Chief. Right about get water on the fire. You get water on the fire, yes. a lot of problems go away. Oh, golly. You know, and, and, and there are some departments out there, Tom, that the only time they take their hose off is for a, for a run or when it's hose testing time. And I, I've joked, you know, I've been a paramedic for a long time, and I'm, I'm very pro fire-based EMS. But the only thing that really matters on your fire engine is the hose and the water. Everything else on there is extra. And I know we run a lot of EMS. Don't come back and over any hate emails. I'm, I'm very pro EMS. What I'm saying is, so you, that's that's why you stretch a hose. You stretch a hose. You stretch a hose. You stretch a hose. You stretch hose. Every chance you get, stretch hose. So it comes off quickly. It gets in the building quickly. You get what? Whether you have to hit it from the outside first or do what you had, whatever you got to do, get water to the fire. So right, right. Yeah, all right and. Uh, so tonight, you know, we remember Assistant Chief Dave McNally, Firefighter Jason Bidding, and Firefighter Nate Tuck, who were killed uh, this day, December 22nd, back in 1999. And uh, just, a, just a few weeks before that is a fire most firefighters are familiar with. What a horrible year 1999 was. Just, what, three weeks before Keokuk, Iowa, we had the Worcestershire, Massachusetts fire. Uh, the cold storage fire resulting in the death of six firefighters, December 3rd, 1999, another horrific day in our fire service history. Well, and so many, so many from that, the guys from Worcester, I love those guys. I love that fire department. I love their people. Uh, I love their firefighters. They, they get it when we talk about who gets it. But if you ask a lot of them that were on the job back then and still are, they said that was a building they always looked at going out. You know, that's one of those buildings that would never want to fight a fire in. You know, and again, you know, long story short, you're talking about a cube. You know, think about what that building was used for, you know, and, and what type of, uh, you know, building construction was put into this, both on the exterior and the inside, on the interior, um, you know, foam and, you know, cork and tar. And it just, I mean, it goes on and on. Um, but but I know you're going to get to it, but the, the good chief, Mac, our good friend, um, you know, long story short, when he stood in that doorway at this particular fire time, I know you're going to talk a little bit about it here. Uh, you know, Mike, Mike McNamee, uh, uh, McNamee, uh, he stood in that doorway and said no more. He, he, you know, when you talk to Mike, he said, I knew I had four gone. He had no idea he had six. Mm. You know, there were six already gone, gone. And if he had done that, who knows? Because, you know, How brothers many more, and sisters right? want to help their brothers, you know. I right. Mean, how many right. more they could have lost? And you think about, and they were not happy. They were not happy. I mean, they, they were yelling at them, cursing, not saying nice things. Some of them spit on them. Um, all fences mended afterwards when, you, you know, when everything was rolled out. And he, I mean, he, he, he his actions saved, you know, I, I think more. several more. Yeah. From yeah. Worcester firefighter, you know, firefighter a lot. Yeah. And what did we have there? We had a fire in the, in the cold storage warehouse. Um, Firefighters, two members go off to do search. They're searching the building. They're looking for occupants because squatters are known to be in the building. Fire conditions get worse. They call for help because they're getting disoriented, and several crews start searching for them. Then those crews start getting lost and calling for help. So now more members go. And uh, at one point, Chief McNamee had to say, no more, no more. And uh, a tough decision to make. Um, he, He certainly was... Uh, putting up with a lot of, uh, like you said, people were mad at him. They were fighting him. They were arguing with him, but he made the decision no more. And, and, and you can uh, understand, right? Can you imagine being a firefighter and your your buddies are in there and you're being told we're not going in there? You know, I could, I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying yeah that was fine. It's okay, but I can understand the anger. You know, I can understand what guys are going through, and you know, you you, you put all these pieces together, and this was a fire time that went very badly very quickly from a little bit of smoke to all of a sudden boom here's a i mean everything changed conditions changed and everything else and i think that's when a lot of us get uh snookered right mm-hmm. the chicago term gets snookered is when when all of a sudden you, if you drop your guard or or just you know we're outmatched sometimes right we get to we get into an incident where we're out we're outgunned 
you know, and, and, and I'm not just talking, you know, firefight with the water. We're all gunned. The building, the building has a lot going against us. Mm-hmm. Add the fire to it, and, you know, you, know, you can end up with some, some pretty, you know, tragic results. Yeah, don't be misled uh, by just a little smoke, a light smoke condition because conditions can change quickly. And in this environment, they change quickly, and they were in a maze and uh, led to the death of the firefighters we remember tonight. Firefighter Paul Brotherton, Timothy Jackson, Jeremiah Lucy, Jim J. Lyons the third, Joe McGurk, and Lieutenant Thomas Spencer. You know, may their loss not be in vain. Maybe remember them and their sacrifice and learn from the tragedy of Worcester, Massachusetts in December of 1999. Well, in Worcester, like I said, uh, I, I will say this out loud again, great fire department. Um, I love their, their, their fire president officers, uh, friends, you know, and good, good people. Um, tragedy, we're talking December, struck them again, Tom, like you and I were talking before we went live, December 9, 2018, not that long ago. Uh, firefighter Christopher Roy, uh, 36-year-old firefighter, four-alarm house fire on Lowell Street, uh, uh, ended up losing his life inside a burning building. And uh, I remember I remember, I remember, remember when it was, I was getting all the, the pages, the message, the text messages on it, and I'm like, oh, no, please, no, not Worcester again. You know, I mean, they've been through so much there, right? and especially in December, and uh, heartbreaking, mm-hmm. heart, heartbreaking. Christopher Roy, December 9, 2018 in Worcester. Wow. You know, and we're two days away from, to me, what is just such a unbelievably, unimaginable, senseless tragedy. Two well, days from now, I know which Christmas one you're Eve. Talk about. Yep, West Webster, New York, a suburb of Rochester, not too far from where I am in Buffalo. You know, as we see tonight, sometimes firefighters are going to get killed in the performance of their duties, attempting rescue, going about putting the fire out, going in and getting people and victims. But then something like this happens on Christmas Eve, no less. Tones dropping for what? A routine car fire. Routine, right? The type of alarm we all have turned out for many, many times. They pull up. There's a house burning and a car, I believe, on arrival. Firefighters get off the rig. They're going to work. They're going to work, unbeknownst to them that there's some coward behind a berm above well, these firefighters. Let's stop, right, let's stop right there for a second, Tom, uh, and talk about the definition, because I, I, I say it every time, and I'm so glad you said coward. You know, So just for some of our younger firefighters out there that are tuning in, you know, we're talking the definition of a coward is not just a person who lacks the courage to do or do dangerous or unpleasant things. It's it's also referred to through the dictionary similar to the word weakling, namby pamby, mouse, chicken, scaredy cat, you know, excessively afraid of, of danger or pain. Uh, this is a it is. It, it, I, there's a lot of things in life that you can call me. Don't ever call me a coward. And this was a coward. I'm so glad you said that because I already had a definition written down before we even got going of what a coward is, and that's just what this guy was, a no. coward. So I'm sorry, buddy, go ahead. No, that's okay. You know, these fire what, a routine call. Firefighters going to work, and this guy opens up on them. This coward opens up on them, and four of them are struck by bullets, and two, unfortunately, were murdered on the spot on Christmas Eve in 2012. Um, just It, it just shows there's no routine call, and we're seeing this certainly today in today's challenging times that there's crazy people out there we have to keep our guard up at all times it's a reminder of just how unpredictable this job is and a reminder even back in 2012 we're living in some nasty nasty times today and we need to be cognizant of that and and a great resource for a a lot of what we're talking about tonight is firefighter uh closecalls.com billy goldfeather site he just posted minutes ago uh about keokuk and uh uh, another, it, it, go to it, you can pull up. If you just Google the particular fire, you're going to find the fire by close calls dot com. But and, and I, I know you're going to mention this. I'm probably stealing your thunder from you. I probably am, so I'm sorry. I'll say it right up front, Tom. But you know, we're, we're talking about two firefighters out of four that were shot were killed. You know, one of them was a local police lieutenant, and the other one was a, was a, a 911 dispatcher right. in Monroe, mm-hmm. Monroe County. Vol, you know, volunteering. One's a dispatcher, all right, very close to both of our hearts, right, Tom? And then mm-hmm. a police lieutenant, another court. And, you know, you're, you're right, you talk about, I hate the word routine, but you're, you're en route. You got, you know, 
you, you know, you, you got uh, uh, what's coming in is a, a car fire with, ex, you know, with exposure and blah, blah, blah. And, the, and the next thing you know, you know, and, and I'll say this, if it wasn't for the one firefighter that was, that was, that was, that was injured getting on the radio, it, it, we've always talked about this. I've talked to people out there. How many other firefighters would have been just pecked off, you know, picked off when they got there? If this right. one firefighter didn't have, you want to talk about the survival instincts to get on the radio after being shot and warn the incoming units, how many more could have been taken from us by this right. coward? Oh, right. Reminder of the unpredictability of the job. And tonight we remember the two firefighters killed. Uh, the police lieutenant was Michael J. Ciparini, if I'm saying that right. He was 43 years old. And the dispatcher, uh, Thomas uh, Kizkalka, he was uh, only 19 years old. And then the two wounded firefighters, uh, Theodore Scardino and Joseph Hofstetter, thank God they survived. And thank God they had, one of them had to wear with all to get on the radio and warn the others, or it could have been so much worse. Terrible tragedy. Terrible, sickening tragedy. And in my hometown, two days after Christmas, we had a horrific event that I remember. I was alive for it. I remember the boom, and our department actually responded into the city that night. I'll get to that in a minute. December 27, 1983, Buffalo, New York. Five Buffalo firefighters killed in the line of duty, along with two civilians, hundreds injured, on December 27, 1983, when a large propane tank exploded in a building, North Division and Grosner Street. Folks, the audio and some video of this is on YouTube. As with most of these incidents we've talked about tonight, you can actually hear the dispatch, a famous Buffalo Fire dispatcher by the name of Albert, putting it out as an alarm of fire for a large leaking propane tank, as he termed it to the chief as the chief responded. Chief, you have a report of a ruptured large LP tank in the building, a full assignment responded, which was three engines, two trucks, and the chief. Engine arrives. Shortly thereafter, the chief calls on location, and 37 seconds after the chief arrived, a 500-pound propane tank exploded, leveling the building, killing five firefighters instantly, and injuring hundreds of civilians. Crazy situation well, We're talking here in a, a four-story warehouse that's 50 by 100 feet, you know, ordinary constructed, with heavy timber construction as well, leveled, just absolutely leveled, you know, and and, and damaged to, to to the surrounding area. I mean, that's mm. think about. I mean, that's 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 an that's an incredible, incredible, devastating explosion. And somebody we all know very well was a young probationary firefighter at the time who responded on the third alarm to this incident, and that's Mike Lombardo. He was a probationary Mike Lombardo, firefighter with commissioner. Buffalo. Yep, commissioner and, and yep, uh, friend to all, longtime volunteer firefighter as well, locally here where I live, and now he has moved out of the area, but he still volunteers. He was a probie that night on Engine 33 and responded in on the third alarm, and um, the chief, first arriving chief, the battalion chief, legendary in our area by the name of Harvey Supple, commanded that fire after the explosion with a large piece of wood that penetrated his neck and was sticking out of his neck and just missed his juggler vein. Yet he stood there giving orders and directing incoming units. I believe it was an engine that called for the second alarm, but then he uh, he, he got up, dusted himself off, and with a five-inch piece of wood that was stuck in his throat, commanded operations until they finally convinced him to get in an ambulance and get off to the hospital. Incredible. Absolutely. Incredible. And, uh, if I may, just uh, I'd like to say the, the incoming chief that relieved Chief Harvey Supple, Harvey Supple was a battalion chief. His brother, Jack Supple, was the division chief who came in and relieved him and got him to go to the hospital, and then he took over the fire. And if I may take just a moment to let our viewers know, our listeners know, Jack Supple and his brother, legendary chiefs in the Buffalo Fire Department, Harvey passed away several years ago. Jack just passed away a couple of weeks ago at the age of 92. He truly was a gentleman and just a great human being being a wonderful, 
warm-hearted, kind man. And you know, I just got to tell you a quick story. I ran into him at a barber shop, say, three, four years ago, local barber shop. We're getting our hair cut. We talked fire for 20 minutes, said our goodbyes. I go home. I'm cleaning my gutters. I'm on a ladder. We clean our gutters in the Buffalo area. We got to get the leaves out <laughs> before the snow comes down. I'm cleaning my not gutters. Like, not like anybody else. <laughs> I turn around, and who's walking up my driveway? Jack Supple, because he had some photographs of my fire department back in the day, and he wanted to give them to me. Just a, I don't even know how he got my address. I don't, I, I don't know. We, we knew each other, but not very well. We just ran into each other at the barber shop. Yet two hours later, he's walking up my driveway to give me some photographs. And Jack just passed away uh, just a couple weeks ago at 92 years of age, and just a great man. But... Uh, the lesson with this fire is, hey, think of that, the next smell, smells and bells call you go on, right? Here's a routine, you know, it was a large propane tank, but how many times have we gone for leaking propane tanks or natural gas leaks? Oh. And this led to the death of five firefighters, and hundreds of civilians were injured. Yeah, you said it's, it's, you know, when we, you know, and it, it, not that they were, but the lesson should be for those that maybe aren't, uh, is dialed in, if you will, like you said, when it comes to the gas leak call, whether it's propane or natural or whatever, that, you know what, if you want if you want to call us the what if or the sky is falling people, I'm happy to do In fact, I'm honored if you say that about us because that's how you keep firefighters um, alive in the future. And, Tom, before we, we, we get done here, I, I, I really don't want to miss this opportunity to remember one more pretty freaking incredible firefighter. It's Lieutenant Joe Samick. Um, Joe died December 6, 1989. He was a friend um, and a uh, uh, second due engine at a fire in a, in, a, in a very nice community where they were responding. And uh, long story short, uh, a, a misread of the building, walkout basement that was missed. Joe ended up falling in the basement, hung up there for a while with another firefighter until he ended up falling all the way in, mm. uh, crawled around, almost made it to the, you know, got to the stairs and, Eventually found him and drug him out and CPR'd him, and he didn't make it. Uh, Joe Joe was a fire buff like me. We used to chase fires together. Um, pretty 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 incredible individual. Uh, used to teach a lot of classes. Uh, kind of one of those cutting edge guys that that, that cherished the history of the fire service. Was into the job, couldn't get enough of it. Um, this is uh, with the Pleasant View Fire Protection District on the southwest side of Chicago. Um, very incredible individual. Uh, that was December 6, 1989, and the next month at a staff meeting at U of I, uh, at the Fire Service Institute, I asked Jim Straseski. I, I had actually sent him an email after this saying, I got an idea for a class uh, that's dedicated to teaching firefighters how to save firefighters, and it's a class called Saving Our Own Techniques for Firefighter Rescues, and uh, Saving Our Own was, was born uh, with, with some great instructors and uh, and everything else. So, uh, uh, you know, Hmm. A lot of lessons learned from that particular fire. You know, another fire to talk about another day, like we said, right. to really get into right. all the details so hard in a couple hours. But uh, for those that have done the same in our own training with the, you know, the Nance drill that we do, the hit cuff knot, the, the, the Langbert drill, the Denver rescue on the, based on injury to Mark Langbert, you know, the room, you know, we're talking about the, the second floor rescue, the stair rescue, you know, everything for rip bags to, you know, when John saw with the rope slide ladder, all that stuff. Uh, the saving roll program wouldn't have been a saving roll program um, uh, saying we got to do something to prevent this stuff from happening. And uh, I always said there wouldn't have been a saving roll program if it wasn't for Lieutenant Joe Samick. So God bless you, Joe. Thank you. God bless Joe. Absolutely. And thank you, Chief, for everything you've done. I mean, as a result of that, out of this horrible tragedy came something good that how many lives maybe have <laughs> undoubtedly you and, and John Salka saved with your classes. So, well, you know, make it good out say of that, but well, here, you know, and here we are. We're, we're, you know, I know you're finishing things up here in a couple of minutes, but we start off saying it. Um, don't look at this right as a buzzkill. You know, uh, this is a, another opportunity to to look up some of the incidents that Tom brought up tonight to to your listeners to to sit down with your people at the kitchen table on drill night. You know, um, you know, do a line of duty at book report drill. Take one of these. You know, take a, a you know an incident. It may have to be a line of duty that take one of these and say, okay, let's let's do this. Going to be drill night. This is going to be drill day. We're going to talk about this fire backwards and forwards, and the lessons learned from it. Um, you know, whether it's whether it's 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 code 
uh, violations and blocked and, and impeded and, and insufficient, you know, means of egress, exits, so so forth, to, to what you have to be doing in schools, to, you know, the heart and soul that you talked about that some of our federal firefighters have shown, some of our other firefighters, um, you know, uh, your pre-plans, your, 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 your fire inspections, you know, get water on the fire, uh, talk about those fires you would never want to, you know, the buildings you would never want to talk, you know, fight a fire in. Um, and, and like you said, with, uh, you know, this, you know, not taking for granted that gas leak or so on and so forth, but you never know, you know, West, West Webster, New York, it's like, golly, there's a lot of evil people out there, man. And, you know, thank God a firefighter could pull off warning everybody else who really had a much more, you say much more horrible than it already was. Oh, right. Uh, with probably more firefighters being taken from us, but. But at the same time, I, I said it's beginning time. I'll say this one more time before you close things out. It's also time, like you talked, you actually were doing it, celebrating their lives. Celebrate, know, know that they were just like you. If you're a firefighter, they were they were sitting in your firehouse on drill night, on your business meeting night, after the pager goes off, your career guy, they were sitting on the kitchen table. They left their shoes on the floor of the apparatus floor. They left their shoes there. You know, they, they jumped on a rig. They had pictures of their kids inside their helmets. They had in their, if they have a personal locker or their their, their turnout lot, you know, their PP locker, the volley place, they had pictures of their kids and little personal, you know, memorabilia and artifacts. Their cars were in the parking lot. They had families at home. Um, they were you and I. Uh, so so I guess, you know, never forgetting means never forgetting, but at the same time, celebrate. They were pretty incredible people. And Tom, I'll say this once in a while, I need to laugh about when you hear these stories and just go, God, it, what, that guy was such a funny shit. I, I miss his humor. You know, that's Joe. Joe. Joe should have been a comedian. He was so funny. You know, he can make you laugh when you're having one of your worst days. I think sometimes we dull sometimes on the sad part of it. We need to celebrate their lives as well. Each and every fire department we talked about tonight's an incredible fire department, incredible people within those organizations. Um, those guys, the, you know, these, these at least the civilians too. You know, we're we're just like all of us. Uh, celebrate mm-hmm. their lives. Uh, we're in the holiday season here, and it's time to. Especially, like you say, after the dumpster fire that 2020 was, um, to, to celebrate and uh, know that we've got a, uh, hopefully a great year coming, and uh, yep. you know, and remember those know that, that we that remember these forward. guys and gals. Know that we remember them and their sacrifice, and we honor them. And as long as we speak their names, they will never die. And there's more. Well, we could go on and on. As we mentioned, you've already well, mentioned a couple Worcester, Worcester. Worcester had the uh, one firefighter pass away just a few years ago. Um, the South Side of Chicago uh, uh, on 12-6, um, on uh, December 6, 1989. FDNY just had a 22nd anniversary, I believe, of the Vandalia Avenue fire where three of their members were killed. Uh, December 20th, 1991, there was four firefighters killed in Breckenridge, Pennsylvania. These sacrifices and tragic fires through the month of December, many more than we talked about tonight, but something as all professional as a professional firefighter we should uh read about them learn about what happened and 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 talk about it in our firehouses because we deserve they deserve to be remembered as well as their sacrifice and chief one more quick thing if you don't mind i know we're going to wrap it up right now but um i got a new segment on the show here and where people are going to write in and ask me questions and i get a lot of emails just like you chief right we get a lot of emails so many great firefighters out there looking for information looking for advice looking for help and so if anyone would like to reach out to me on the volunteer side or anything i can help you with please send me an email i'll give you my information at the end of the show here but i had a listener send in with a a great question um his department chief is stepping down and he's looking for a little advice um he was uh this chief was someone they all looked up to someone they could trust he took care of the equipment took care of the members um but he says that the current chief that's taking over the interim chief and some of the officers really aren't leaders the training officer is hasn't even done a drill in the past two years uh the 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 other leader, supposed leader in the department, is, I guess, uh, a police officer, a high-ranking police officer, and he says he's busy enough doing that and he's drowning in the work. So he's looking for me to give some advice on how he can handle this situation and try and train his department, get his people fired up for training. And my advice is start small. Take 
some people, like-minded people like yourself, and go off and train. You do some training. You think about some things you can do in the firehouse that can help educate and bring members up to speed. And don't worry about those naysayers and those that don't want to participate. Well, exactly. And sometimes in, I, I, some of the best advice I've ever gotten from a mentor was a phrase I use all the time. It's probably one of my most used phrases. Worry about the things you can fix, not the things you can't. You know, and just like you said, that means being the best firefighter you can be, be the best lieutenant, the best captain, whatever it is. Be the best you can be where you're at. Everything in life is temporary. Stay positive. Stay out of the drama. There's young. If you've been on there for a while, there's young firefighters. You have no idea, and, and they would never probably tell you. They're looking up to you without even telling you they're looking up to you. They need you. They need you to be that person that's, you know, nobody wants to show up at the firehouse and, and be in a hot mess. Nobody wants to show up at the firehouse and be, you know, drugged down into someone's misery. Nobody wants to show up at the firehouse and, and, and be unhappy. So, we, Tom, we draft off each other. I draft off your energy. You're, you're one of the most energetic people I know and do incredible things with, with you know, the, the, your, your program and everything else associated with your program. It's not even fair to say the program. There's so much. Of, it's like, say, Bobby Halton, the editor of Fire Engineering, what he is like. Oversees so many different areas, and he's incredible at it. Um, the professional volunteer fire department. You know, it's there's so many resources out there, but the energy level, staying positive. The other firefighters are counting on you. You know, worry about the things. You, sometimes we waste so much time and energy on stuff we can't fix that we end up wasting precious seconds. You know, stay ener- stay energized. Do you do things that other people could draft off your energy? Fight and work your way through it. And, again, everything in life is temporary. You know, we get impatient in the fire service sometimes. And, you know, next thing you know, you know, all of a sudden you're talking a couple of years from now about, do you remember what it was like way back when, boy, we come back, you know, made full circle. That would be right. Thing, you know what I'm saying? Right. Passion, uh, great passion, advice. Passion cures a lot of problems. <laughs> it sure does. It sure does, right? Passion is Definitely does. And, Chief, I, 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 we, we missed one of the biggest fires. We'll have to come back to it someday <laughs> in American history, and that was the Iroquois Theater fire. I was going to finish with that one because that was a December 30th fire back in 1903 that killed over 600 people. But we'll get to that another day. How's that sound? I, I think I've taken enough of your time tonight, and I, I, I think well, uh, I learned a lot, and I we appreciate it your briefly. time. We mentioned it briefly. <laughs> we we'll mentioned it briefly. We'll circle back to it. We talked about it, so we'll get to yeah. it. We'll get to it because there's we, well, Tom, there's probably thank you. it was my honor, buddy. It was my absolute oh. honor. Well, fant- I wish you and your family a incredible Christmas. You know, enjoy your great family and the time together. And I, I just wish you all the best for the holiday season and in 2021 coming up. I hope I hope I see you down the road and we're out and about at these events again sooner than later. Uh, it'll happen, buddy. It'll happen. You know, we'll get there. Uh, I'll, I'll say this uh, ending ending statement. I've never been as proud of the fire service as I am right now. You know, we've been th- here. We're throwing another whole curveball, and we've dealt with the fire service. Our volunteer and career fi- every firefighter it, it has has risen up and done some incredible things through this whole you know pandemic. And I, I am. I'm just. I'm just so proud of the the guys and gals that are out there and what they're doing. I'm, I'm just. Who'd, who'd have thought? Who'd have thought we were going through we're going through and then respond to the calls we are dispatching the calls we're doing all this stuff and god bless you god bless each and every one of you for just making us all proud thank you fantastic and chief just real quick if someone wanted to get a hold of you please let us know how they can reach out to you they have a question on these fires the history of the fire service or any of your programs or maybe have questions for you how can they best get a hold of you I think the easiest way is my email, and it's it's a simple one. It's cheaplasky at gmail.com, and that's Lasky, L-A-S-K-Y. So cheaplasky at gmail.com, and give us a shout. Very good, Chief. Thanks again for your time, and again, Merry Christmas, and all the best coming up in 2021. Merry Christmas. I love you, buddy. Thanks for all you do, pal. I appreciate your friendship. Thank you, brother. Same to you. Thank you so much. All right, Tom. Bye-bye, buddy. Take care. Just uh, what a great chief, what a great man, what a great mentor to so many, and uh, just so much information to help uh, the show along here this evening. And, folks, all of these fires, the ones we talked about, even the ones we didn't get to that are in the pages of American firefighting history, they all serve as the very real reminders of this very real danger 
and unpredictability that exists in our job. And again, not trying to be a downer, not trying to cast a negative feeling about what you know should be a very fun and joyful month, but it's so important to turn these tragedies into something that can help us all become better as firefighters. And what we have often said on this show, there's so much that we can learn in the wake of these events, a lot of which we talked about tonight. And there's more to learn. Dig deep into these stories. Learn about these fires. Learn about who these people, these victims, firefighters and civilians, who they were. And by reading about these sacrifices and who they were and what they did, we honor them and we pay tribute to all of them as well. And we can help protect a whole new generation of firefighters because, as is often said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And that is so true in war, in politics, in life, and it's certainly true in our fire service as well. Again, I'd like to thank Fire Engineering and Chief Bobby Halton and Clarion Events for supporting these podcasts If anyone would like to reach out to me, if you have questions for my end of the show segment where we would take a question from one of our listeners, please email me, tamerrill63 at aol.com. Check out any of my social media platforms, including the Professional Volunteer Fire Department on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. I have a YouTube channel now where I'll be putting this episode on tomorrow. All my other episodes are also on my YouTube channel to make it easy to find. I am in the process of putting together many other things for the YouTube channel. It's also loaded fire service history videos because I love history as you know from tonight. So please check it out. Subscribe to the Professional Volunteer Fire Department YouTube channel and get a hold of me at tamerrill 63 at AOL.com or through any of my social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, And lots more coming. 2021, I promise I'm going to have a revised and polished and modern website up to help get a hold of all of you and post some really cool things. My next show is scheduled for Tuesday, February 2nd, and I look forward to again talking about our great iconic volunteer fire service, and I promise to continue bringing topics to you that are so important. So thanks for tuning in wherever you happen to be. Thanks for listening. Please stay safe. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas, a very happy and joyous holiday season, and all the best in 2021. Folks, remember, developing and maintaining and portraying a professional is the duty and responsibility of all firefighters, paid or volunteer. It's really that simple. No matter where you are or who you serve, Your residents are owed professional service delivered by professional firefighters representing a professional organization. Thanks for listening in. Take care.